Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries in programs like this. We'd like to thank the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith, whose generous support has made this episode of Lunch Break Science possible. Here with us today for our very last episode of 2021 is Leakey Foundation grantee, Alexandra Kralik. Alexandra, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Alexandra is joining us from Philadelphia, where she is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research takes her all over the world to study primates. You can, these are just a few of the um, many locations that she's been and will be um, talking about. But today she'll be discussing how orangutan skeletons bust the sex binary. We have a few more amazing photos here. It's kind of fun to get to travel around the world. Generally, we're focusing on somebody who's, you know, working in one specific area. So it's kind of fun <laughs> to see all the different locations. So before we hear from Alexandra, if you're watching us live, you can post questions to the chat at any time, and Alexandra will be answering those questions live during the episode. Also, if you have a question um, or don't understand anything, please feel free to pop a comment or question in the chat right when you think of it. Okay. Um, so also, if you are watching us on the replay, thank you for, for participating. Um, so my first question for you is, you know, your work takes a look at sex differences in great apes and humans, and you focus quite a bit on orangutans. Why are orangutans a good group to study when asking questions about sex differences? Yeah, so I've been interested in sex differences for a long time. And since coming to a four field anthropology program at Penn, I've been able to bring a feminist and queer approach to this work to show how biological sex is more complicated than either male or female, but in fact sits on a spectrum. And I published a piece in Sapiens about this back in 2018. And a lot of people on the internet misunderstood my work to be talking about gender as opposed to biological sex. So what's great about orangutans is that they don't have, to my knowledge, the social context construct of gender. So there isn't this room for the same misunderstanding. And more so, biological sex in orangutans is really quite fascinating. So orangutan adult males actually exist in two types. And so in the zoos, you may have seen the big males with the cheek pads on their faces. This one's not in a zoo, though, <laughs> which we call flanges. So those big cheek pads make a flanged male. But some males will arrest the development of their secondary sex characteristics. So it's kind of like an adult man who can't grow a beard and doesn't really maybe get as smelly and hairy. They look like a fully grown adolescent. So this is one in the wild here. So it's pretty hard to tell the difference between them and females in the wild uh, outside of external genitalia. So we call them adult unflanged males because they don't have those cheek pads and they only really occur in the wild um, or at least they don't occur in zoos to our knowledge. So orangutans are thought of as really highly sexually dimorphic, meaning di meaning two and morph meaning types. So the sex dimorphism, uh, two types by sex, male and female. Uh, so that the idea would be that males are always bigger and larger than the females. But that's not necessarily the case in orangutans. So since orangutans have really similar biology to us, they're a great model for studying how biological sex can be variable in the body and defy some of our expectations. And studying adult unflanged males really helps, us, helps me do that. So how do you go about studying these variations? Yeah, so because they uh, don't really exist in uh, the zoos, a great way to study is the wild ones. And so there's a bunch of uh, formerly wild ones uh, in the skeletal remains in, in museum collections. So I go to museum collections around the world. And so I use a lot of methods to study the skeletons of the adult unflanged males and the skins in the museum collections. So the the main method that I'm really working with is CT scans. So I CT scan the orangutans in the museums. Here I am using a medical CT scanner at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And then I take those CT scans and I get measurements from them. So that's a visual of the CT scan of the bones coming from that scanner. And then here you can see those cross sections. So I get things out of this like uh, polar section modulus, which is a way to measure bone strength, cross sectional area, which is what you were seeing there 
And density, I use something called a phantom, which has rods of known density that I can use to calibrate the density and get the density of the bone. I also study the teeth. So I take molds of the teeth, dental molds, um, and then I work with collaborator Kate McGrath uh, to measure the these stress lines in the teeth to figure out how stressful moments were. I also measure the canine height. You can see I'm doing some canine measurements in this image that helps me determine biological sex. And I photograph the teeth. I use these photos both for the dental mold analysis and to be able to interpret age to see if they have their fully adult teeth. And then this is an image of a CT scan of the last molar, what we call in humans, the wisdom tooth. And that can help me figure out, is this tooth fully developed? Is it fully an adult? And then I also look at epiphyseal fusion, which helps me assess uh, long bone growth and development, which is traditionally associated with, is this a juvenile or an adult? Um, and so you can see the ends of the long bones here, what I'm looking at. And then I'm also measuring long bone length with my osteometric board. I'm getting circumference with a tape measure. I get diameter. This is the calipers that you saw in that image uh, <laughs> of those long bones. And then I look at archival and historical records to learn more about the life of these individuals and the death. And then I take skin measurements of the faces and hair length. Um, this is a new method that I established. So to my knowledge, no one has put together all of these elements together for each individual orangutan in the skeletal collection at the museums. So They've missed some really fascinating stuff for about a century, what I call the old man with a baby body phenomenon. <laughs> this is a fascinating mosaic pattern uh, where an adult male can actually have adult teeth, but uh, what looks like baby long bones, a juvenile looking adult. Uh, long bones on an adult. And so this comes from this holistic approach uh, where I'm trying to restore narrative and identity to these individuals. And I'm actually organizing and chairing a AAA session that's going to be happening uh, this Saturday with colleagues who are doing similar work to discuss how we go about restoring narrative and identity to great ape skeletal remains and museums. That sounds like an awesome session. If uh, there are any uh, AAA members or meet, uh, meeting attendees out there, we shared a link to um, that session in the chat. Let's take a closer look at one of your methods, though, the analysis of long bone fusion. For our viewers out there, be sure to observe closely because you're going to have a chance to test your skills. Yes, yeah, so the long bone ends are called the epiphysis, and the long bone shaft is called the diaphysis. So here you can see this is the place where that epiphysis and that diaphysis is meaning that crack there is what we're calling the growth plate. So they're separate as uh, in kids and juveniles, and then they end up fusing together in adulthood to become a single bone. So kids actually have more bones than adults do. Um, and then during growth and development, that location where those are separate fuse, uh, once a child has reached their adult height, and then you have that adult bone that you know of. And so it's actually called the growth plate because it's the location where the long bones grow longer. So you can see there's no growth plate in this image. Um, it's just a regular humerus. And that's so this is an adult long bone. And so these growth plates are the location where long bones grow longer as a kid gets taller. So this is because long bones are going to grow longer um, kind of, I guess, faster than they're going to grow wider. So there needs to be a specific place where that's happening. So that's why when you were a kid, it, doctors may have said it was important that you didn't injure a growth plate because mm -hmm. if you'd injured it, maybe that bone would stop growing long and you might have like asymmetrical limbs. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but th that's the concerns because that's the place where that long bone growth is happening. Um, and so this, uh, we're going to look at some examples of uh, long bone growth. Yeah, so now that you all know a little bit more what a uh, juvenile and adult long bone look like, we'd like you to all try your s new skills at assessing some long bone. So um, Alexander is going to share a photo of a long bone, carefully observe its characteristics, and submit your assessment of what type of bone this is in the chat. Is it juvenile or an adult? Um, there will be two rounds, so be sure to submit which round when you submit your answer. So... Um, Alexander, what might help our viewers guess? So you are looking at those long bone ends, the epiphysis and the shaft at that location where they meet. Does it look fused or unfused? Does it look mm. like this was still at some point a separate bone or is it just one complete bone? Is there a crack there or a space where those two bones are meeting? 
or does it just look like a continuous bone? And the continuous bone is going to be the adult. If there's a crack or a separate bone there or that end is missing, then we're thinking about it's probably a kid or a juvenile. Okay. We're starting to see some, we, or at least we have one response so far. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Is that cheating? <laughs> no. Um, so we have two responses. We have one juvenile. We have two juvenile. So okay. what is the correct answer? Juvenile. Our two respondents were correct. You can see that crack at the uh, distal end of the humerus. That's where it was zooming in. There's actually no proximal head, right, of the of the femur. So if people know what a femur looks like, they might have been like, that looks a little bit off because that, that piece was so infused. I, I didn't even have it in the image. It's separate. Okay, now we're going to do round two, which will be a little trickier. Um, let's see here. Oh. Be sure to submit your guesses in the chat. So you can ignore the sacrum because I didn't talk about that. But just looking at those long bones, looking at the ends, does this look like a continuous bone? Or does it look like a place where another separate end is fusing to the shaft? So it's kind of zooming in, two of these bones it's zooming in in are the femur and the humerus. And so thinking back to what it looked like on the other example will help as well. Okay, let's let's see it one more time. I feel like I, we should, I should have left it <laughs> at the very end a little bit longer. Okay, we have some assessments. Let's see what we've got here. We've got got uh, adult. Yes, we've got another adult <laughs> from from our um, past lunch break science guest, uh, Kate McGrath, um, and my collaborator. Uh, every every. So far, everyone says adult. So yes. what is the correct answer? It is adult. You can see that we actually now have the head of the femur. So that's there and it's continuous. It doesn't have a crack between it. It's a, just a full, complete adult bone. And you can also see that at the proximal end of the humerus. I don't have the distal end in that image, but you're still seeing that these long bones are totally fused. This is an adult individual. Well, thank you so much for sharing that activity with us. It was really fun. Um, as you mentioned, though, uh, your work has a very holistic approach that applies methods that hadn't been applied to great apes before. And also, uh, you've developed new methods. Uh, what is the process of establishing a new method of analysis? Yes, yeah, it's, it's actually quite challenging. So I needed to find a way to quantify something that hadn't been quantified before. So uh, at least uh, in museum skeletal collections. So I reached out to orangutan researcher Aaron Vogel, who's uh, at the time PhD student Didik, uh, was measuring the living orangutan faces. And so I learned how he did it and was trying to apply these methods to the faces in the museum collection. So um, in the museum collections, you've seen images of bones and teeth, but what you may not know is they also have skins. So kind of like maybe you think of a bear pelt, right? Uh, is, is sort of like pelt might be a, a, a word to think of in that sense. Um, they have skins of orangutans as well. So I was using these skins to try to measure, but the, the measurements for the living ones didn't translate perfectly well. So I needed to think of something uh, that would be consistent on every skin that's always present. So what I realized is that, you know, even as deformed as these skins can be, there was always an eye and an ear. So what I did was I measured the eye to the edge of the face and the eye to the ear. And so you can see here box plots of my measurements. And so face to the uh, face size, eye to edge is uh, TDIC's um, methodology and it, it works well, but the face size, eye to ear works very well. You can see there's absolutely no overlap between the flanged males and the other two categories, unflanged and female, and unflanged and female have the same size. So this matches what we know about the living ones. And so I, then I knew my method was working and it was able to show me that I could use these museum skeletal collections and these skins to assess flanging status. Um, and so what I ended up doing was um, publishing this method. So as a warning, this next image may be kind of disturbing or upsetting to some viewers because these are skins of formerly alive uh, orangutans that aren't housed in museum collections. But this image can show you the 
the method that I developed, which is now published in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology with co-author Kate McGrath, who you saw responding earlier. Um, and now others can use this method. So you can see the circle shows that flange that uh, you saw an image of a flange male before. And so that's that flange. And then on the unflanged individual, that flange isn't present. And because you know how deformed these skins can be, having that measurement could really help substantiate that I can make the make be able to tell that difference. You've had the opportunity to work at some of the most amazing museums and with some of the most amazing collections all over the world. What is it like? Yeah, it may not seem as glamorous as the traditional idea of the field from the outset, but it's not only is it my version of the field, but it's really exciting for me. I, I get to come to museums and study the collections. Um, I get to see exhibits while I'm at these museums, live in, live in different cities across the U.S. and Europe while I work. I lugged around this huge wooden osteometric board everywhere I went to measure the long bone length. So you can see here, this is an image of me carrying around to five different museums. Lugging it across Europe uh, was quite challenging on metro systems and stuff like this. Um, but it it's worth it for the consistency of measurement. Now I have a, um, a travel sized osteometric board, which helps. But every museum collection is different. I never know what I'm going to find until I get there. And I've seen some really wild things, remains that were kind of almost mummified remains that come from pet shops and from the circus. Uh, one orangutan that died during childbirth, that was really exciting to find. Uh, I mean, not that it died during childbirth, but, but that that's possible in orangutans was really interesting. Uh, there was an orangutan that fell out of a tree and broke his arm and it rehealed incorrectly. So he was in the wild without a doctor to reset the bones. So as you can see here, it's they've got this giant bump on that arm bone, the humerus, and it's because it, it rehealed, it broke, and it just rehealed like that. <laughs> so that wow. was fascinating. Lots of interesting things. And I've also gotten to do some nerdy travel while I'm going around to these different cities and seeing these museums. So uh, like when I was in France, I got to see the Lascaux painted caves, uh, which is a, a human origins thing that I've always been excited to see in person. Uh, and see some really exciting fossil finds at museums that are on exhibit that you can only see in person. Um, I got to go to the Neander Valley in Germany. So I'm standing in the place where the very first Neanderthal fossil was ever found. And um, this is the Neanderthal Museum. So I'm here with a, a recreation of what a Neanderthal would have looked like. And we don't look too different. So that's <laughs> a fun part about it. At Puerca, Spain, a famous archaeological site where a lot of fossil hominins were found. Um, it's a very excited face. And when I was in South Africa, I got to go to the Cradle of Humankind and see Homo naledi. So that's actually the, the skeleton of the fossil Homo naledi um, right after it was discovered. And, and it was on exhibit briefly for only two months. And I happened to be able to go in that brief period of time. So that was really fun. I'm sure you've got some amazing stories with from working with these collections. Could you share one of them with us? Yeah, so I, probably my favorite story from was from when I was in Berlin at the Museum for Naturkunde, uh, the Natural History Museum there. So as you know, a lot of museum collections in Berlin lost a lot of their collections and uh, stuff on exhibit during the bombings in World War II. So what they have remaining is quite rare and precious to them. So we looked at the fusion of longbone ends earlier, and I, I showed you there was that... Uh, head of the femur that was actually missing. So sometimes the long bone ends when they're unfused will be somewhere else in the collection. And, and so there was a kid who was still growing and developing those long bone ends from the shaft that they were separate. And they, I thought they were wrapped up in this newspaper and I needed to take them out of the newspaper and put them onto the end so I can measure them to, with the osteometric board to get that long bone length. So because I thought it was wrapped in this newspaper, I was trying to open it up, but it was really hard to open and I didn't want to damage anything. So I took it to the collections managers and they were like, oh, we'll open this up. And so they're carefully opening up and they get really quiet. And I'm like, what is, what is going on? And they're just like, this newspaper, it's from 1923. Look at the date. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, it survived World War II. They let me keep the piece of newspaper. Um, and so here it is. This is a, a piece of that newspaper. You can see the image here and you can see that number, 1923 in there. Um, and so it not only had this piece of newspaper survive World War II and it had this bone, but what made it really special was no one had opened that newspaper in like almost a century. This was uh, 2018. And I, I couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it, that no one had needed that long bone in a century, <laughs> that long bone end. I felt really special that I was the first person trying to, to unwrap that and, and access those remains. But yeah, it was just, they thought it was really special and it felt cool to be a part of as well. 
Oh, that is so awesome. I'm, I'm sure you I'm sure you probably have enough stories to fill a whole episode, but um, <laughs> let's actually hear more about you. When did you become interested in studying biological anthropology? I was always extremely interested in human evolution. I uh, was a very nerdy high schooler, so I would read Scientific American and I would watch science documentaries uh, about evolution on the History Channel, read popular science books. Uh, I was reading stuff about written by Desmond Morris and Helen Fisher and Leonard Schlein, but I didn't know that it was a real career possibility. So when I went to college at George Washington University, I, I began college as a pre-med major. I thought, oh, I, I love studying human evolution. So being a doctor and studying the body was the natural progression in my head. Um, I trained to be an EMT and I hated it. You know, I loved everything about the body uh, and how it worked and, and anatomy, but I just couldn't remember medications and, and how to fix it. So at the same time, I was taking Intro to Human Evolution and my professor, Dr. Shannon McFarlane, was talking about her work with the gorillas and going to Rwanda. And it just sounded so incredible. And I really wanted to, to go and, and be a part of that. So I started doing research with her and it took me to Rwanda with her. So I, here I am with the mountain gorillas in Rwanda. So I wasn't studying their behavior. I was studying their teeth. But while I was there, I got to see the living gorillas. And honestly, I was really hooked. Here I am, Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International, like with a giant smile on my face. Like, how is this real? Um, and here I am photographing teeth. So I just really was hooked. And there was really no turning back after that. It's, it's all I wanted uh, for my career. And so I actually presented that research at the AABAs, which is what they're now called at the time. They were called the AAPAs. Um, and here I am presenting that tooth research. I'm putting to photos of radiographs of the gorilla teeth. And so then when I got back the summer between my junior and senior year, I did an internship through the NHRE program at the Smithsonian. And I studied wrist bones with Dr. Matt Cherry at the museum. So you can see I've got this 3D laser scan of a wrist bone on that computer screen. And I was segmenting it out for geometric morphometric analysis. And this is actually a photograph that the laser scanner took of me analyzing that wrist bone uh, as I was laser scanning bones at the museum. And that time with him at the museum just completely solidified my interest in museum collections, the stories that they held. And I, you know, really went on from there to what I'm doing for my PhD. Well, I'm excited to hear more about your work in your presentation. But before we turn the virtual floor over to you, Alexandra, if you are enjoying this episode, whether you're watching us live or on the replay, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook or Twitter so you never miss an episode. Now let's turn the virtual floor over to Alexandra and learn more about her research. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to give a talk and it's going to be about my dissertation research. It's a combination of published and unpublished work. The research is on orangutan skeletons, as we've talked about, and I'm highlighting how features previously considered dichotomous, either male or female, by biological sex actually sit on a spectrum. So the sex binary carries the notion that men and women have dichotomously different genitals, chromosomes, hormones, and body shapes and sizes. But in reality, 17 out of every thousand babies born have intersex traits from additional chromosomes to mixed gonads and genitalia shown here. That's about the same percentage as redheads in the world. There's nothing inherently female about the X chromosome and people can live their lives as women only to find out late in life they have XXY chromosomes or XY. Both men and women have the same circulating hormones, and since testosterone converts into estrogens in the body, there are men with higher estrogen levels than some women. And the difference in mean height between men and women is much less than the variation within men or within women. Additional features that do not fit clearly into a sex binary are behavior, like aggression, and bones, which is the context in which I investigate the sex binary. So in 2018, I wrote a piece for Sapiens, an anthropology magazine, in which I argue that past researchers for skeletons in either a male or female category, which resulted in a male sex biased in bioarc and forensic arc research. Uh, in the past, researchers were more likely to place indeterminate individuals in a male sex category rather than acknowledging that some individuals do not fit cleanly and clearly into either the male or female category. Later, the indeterminate sex category helped to correct for the sex bias research. When the article was picked up at The Atlantic, they changed the title from sex in the skeleton to gender. 
as you may know, sex refers to a person's biology, like chromosomes, genitals, while gender is a uh, is social. It's how we feel, how we present, how we dress, how we talk. So there were a lot of people who misunderstood my article to be talking about gender and wrote to me about transgender issues in the current political moment. So I just mentioned this because orangutans, the subject of my dissertation research, have no, to my knowledge, social concept of gender. So they have biological sex, though. So it's my hope that researching sex in the skeleton of a non-human primate with similar biology to our own may aid in depersonalizing some of these issues and really getting to the heart of talking about biological sex in the skeleton. This is possible because researchers forcing skeletons into two sex categories is not exclusive to the study of humans. My dissertation investigates the sex binary in a species perceived as having really big sex differences between males and females and interrogating the appropriateness of the term sex dimorphism and the assumption that it carries, particularly in orangutans. So orangutans are an ideal animal model to test questions of biological sex in the skeleton because there are two different types of reproductively capable adult males. Flanged males, as seen on the right, are the type well-known and seen in zoos. They are dominant. They have those cheek pads we talked about. They also have throat pouches for calling for females. They typically have preferential mating access to females, particularly the ones who have had babies before. The other type of male is uh, not found in zoos. They're found in the wild and they can, they're called adult unflanged males. You see one on the left in a forest tree. They are reproductively capable. They can make babies, but they typically mate with the females who've never had a baby before. And they have arrested that development of the secondary sex characteristics. So in orangutan case, it's not just getting smellier and hairier, but it's also those cheek pads. It's uh, the throat pouch. And they can arrest the development of those features for anywhere from a few years to 20 years. Since adult unflanged males are only found in the wild, little is known about their body size differences from flanged males and females, given the challenge of assessing weight and taking other body size measurements in the wild. So the question remains, how large are adult unflanged males with respect to flanged males and females? Since adult unflanged males cannot be found in zoos, it's a challenging question to answer methodologically. So I see three possible answers to this question. Hypothesis one is based on a long-standing visual observation by researchers that adult unflanged males look female-sized. While not immediately obvious that this hypothesis may reinforce the sex binary, it does assume that there are either male or female categories and that adult unflanged males are biological exceptions that fit into the female category. This is reinforced by earlier studies describing the sexual strategy of unflanged males as sneaking and forcing copulations. Not that they never do this, but it's not exclusive to adult unflanged males. Flanged males do this as well. And they are the preferred mate choice sometimes of females who've never had a baby before. This narrative left a lingering con connotation that a adult unflanched males are the deviant ones. When talking about the sex binary, sociologist Judith Lorber writes, the conformist and the deviant. These are two sides of the binary concept. The second hypothesis is similarly binary, uh, and it's based on a recent study looking at creatinine urine by my colleague Caitlin O'Connell from Aaron Vogel's, Aaron Vogel's field site in Borneo. These results seem to show that adult unflanged males may have similar muscle mass and thus similar size to adult unflanged males. So still fitting in that male size category. And the third hypothesis does not negate the former two observations actually, but includes them as possible outcomes in a biological sex spectrum. So this explanation suggests that adult unflanged males exhibit a range of sizes falling between male and female averages. This is supported by weights taken at a rehabilitation center in Indonesia by for, for, for formerly wild orangutans uh, by Didik, the uh, P, former PhD student I was talking about earlier. So mature unflanged males were weighed at around 57 kilograms, which was below the flanged male average of 77 and above the adult female limit of 50. So I tested 
these three hypotheses using a collection of orangutans at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, I CT scanned and measured the log bones of the orangutans in the collection and assessed flanging status using the faces of the skins in the collection and age using del dental development, all these methods you saw earlier. My sample sizes are small at the, at the moment that I'm sharing this with you. Um, I only have three confirmed unflanged males from the Smithsonian. So I'm waiting to publish these results until I've analyzed the additional confirmed adult unflanged males Males and likely unflanged males at the field museum that I just scanned and I'm still analyzing. Um, and then after uh, my travels, where I'm going to be CT scanning specimens at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, the American Museum of Natural History, the Academy of Natural Sciences, all of that should add five likely adult unflanged males, um, as well as the Natural History Museum in London, uh, which I've yet to visit. So I don't know how many that will add, but hopefully all of that will add a very helpful number as well. So uh, bone length was assessed for all long bones. These results were presented in a poster at the, at the time AABA, now AAPAs, uh, a, at the time AAPA, now AAPAs in 2019. This box plot showcases results for each bone. So if we isolate the ulna, you can see here that the adult unflanged males in green, uh, this includes uh, both confirmed by skins and likely uh, by, by confirmed by having the same pattern. Uh, they're situated between the adult flanged uh, males and the adult females. So the females are in red and the adult flanged males are in blue. So you can see there's a range of sizes with the mean is closer to the females. It still sits on that spectrum. So cross-sectional geometry, uh, these results are assessed from the CT scans. These are still unpublished, so I put a no tweet symbol. Uh, I will get this out before my dissertation's over, hopefully. This box plot showcases results for each bone. And once again, if we isolate the ulna, you can see here that the adult unflanged males in green are situated between adult females in red and adult flanged males in blue, exhibiting a range of sizes with a mean, again, closer to the female end of that spectrum. So overall, these results support hypothesis three, that adult unflanged males fall in size between adult males and females, uh, while uh, adult flanged males and adult females, while closer to the female end of that spectrum. This is the hypothesis that supports the notion that biological sex is a spectrum. These results showcase how sex dimorphism, a term that means there are two types by sex, male and female, die, meaning two, morph, meaning type, is an inappropriate term to use for orangutans, given that there are not two morphs by sex. At the 2018, uh, at the time a PA, now a BAs, an alternative phrase was suggested to replace the term sex dimorphism, sex differences. This term would better describe sex-based variation in orangutans than sex dimorphism. When put in conversation with social theory, these results carry further social and theoretical implications, both regarding biological sex and gender. With regards to biological sex, sociologist Judith Lorber writes, data that undermine the supposed natural dichotomies on which the social orders of most modern societies are still based could radically alter political discourses that valorize biological causes, essential heterosexuality, and traditional gender roles in families and workplaces. Since biological sex in orangutan skeletons is not dichotomous, male or female, but instead situated on a spectrum, these results subvert the idea of the sex binary as a natural and biological thing, and in doing so, alter the discourse that places value on biological causes for gendered social order. It is worth noting here that everyone sits on a sex spectrum, not just intersex folks. Uh, for example, in orangutans, the sex spectrum is showcased by individuals that no one is arguing fall into an intersex category, partially evidenced by their full reproductive functioning. But if we continue to see adult unflanched males as abnormal exceptions, this argument is undermined. Therefore, I next deconstruct the narrative of deviance using both biological data and feminist queer theory. Not arguing that orangutans have gender again, uh, but instead that humans have perceived and described orangutan biology through a gendered lens. As Barry Thorne writes, behavior that is gender appropriate is considered normal. Anything else is considered gender deviance. Since adult unflanged males are not acting or looking in what is considered a gender appropriate way, adult unflanged males have been relegated to the category of deviance by researchers. This can be seen in Harrison and Schiffer's 2007, a paper which argues that adult unflanged males evolved more recently in response to nutritional stress and that flanged males were more normal in the past. 
However, my recent paper with colleague Kate McGrath, who I've mentioned before, shows the exact opposite, that adult unflanged males experience less stress in their childhoods than flanged males. Because the forests used to be less stressful than they are today, unflanged males may actually have previously, have previously been the norm. And now flange males are becoming more common with increasingly stressful nutritional environments, I think. We'll see. So perhaps the unflanged males were never the deviants. It's possible. In fact, flange males could even be. So my next step is increasing my sample sizes. I finally visited the Field Museum um, on my leaky grant this past October. Yay! I will be going to the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology in January and the London Museum of Natural History in March. And then I'm also planning on CT scanning uh, orangutan long bones from the American Museum of Natural History and the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. The data from these CT scans will be analyzed with the help of my undergraduate mentees at Penn. Shout out to Sarah Caminito and Clara Nolan. This research can constitute chapter three of my dissertation, along with data on bone density and epiphyseal fusion, which together suggest a possible explanation for the mechanism of arrested development physiologically, which I'm very excited about. The data you saw today will also be used in chapter two of my dissertation as well, which investigates long bone length and cross-sectional differences by species. I'm also working on that by age and sex um, as they relate to levels of terrestriality versus arboreality, which differs by species, age, sex, all of that. Um, I submitted an abstract to the 22 AABAs to present on that. So look out for that if you're going to the ABAs in March, hopefully. We'll see if it's accepted. <laughs> and if you uh, found these results interesting and you want to stay tuned for my papers, presentations, future discoveries, you can follow me on Twitter or at my website to stay tuned. And a big thank you. Thank you to uh, the funding um, and for the Leaky Foundation for having me. Um, yes, there you go. Thank you so much. That was an awesome talk. Um, now we'll be taking some questions from the audience. If you are watching and haven't submitted your question, get those questions into the chat right now. I have an initial question for you. You are incredibly mindful of how narratives created by science affect our understanding of humans and our world in general. Tell us more about this and how it plays a role in your research. Yeah, thanks for that one. So a central theme in my work is casting light on problematic assumptions that permeate scientific narratives of the biological sex. So science based in and rooted in biases is not going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. And this one went on for a long time in the history of science, and it left a legacy that we need to correct. Mm -hmm. For example, in regards to biological sex and the sex binary, to describe sex differences as men are dichotomously different and always taller than women is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And based on bias thinking of how men and women should normatively be. This concept serves to other people who do not cleanly and clearly fit into the dichotomy. We can allow for more complexity that can lead us to more accurate and more inclusive science, which in turn will have positive social repercussions. Science needs to be a science of all humans, not just the ones that fit into what is considered normative. Describing people who don't fit into normative ideas as deviant is inaccurate because they're a normal part of biological variation. And if we are doing science, our work should account for the full breadth and variety of human nature. And this is what my work does in showcasing how features of biological sex are situated on a spectrum as opposed to a dichotomy. Well, thank you so much for that answer. Now let's, um, let's take our first question um, from the viewers. It comes from uh, H, I believe. Ah, yes. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you've had to modify your research activities due to the pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> um, luckily, museums are opening back up again. So I did get to finally go to the Field Museum in Chicago. I had to wait on my Leakey Foundation funding for about 15 months before I could go. So that was a really hard, long wait. Um, I'm now finally going to be able to go to Harvard and London and these other places. But, uh, you know, there was this long gap and this long wait uh, in which I couldn't get out to museums. So unfortunately, that that paper that I talked about with Kate McGrath uh, that's published at the first chapter of my dissertation is with a smaller sample size that I would have liked. We had to explain to reviewers why we had to do it with that smaller sample size. And we had uh, robust enough statistical methods that we could show it was possible. So it was fine. But there is a mention of the pandemic in that paper and and things that couldn't be done because museums were closed. So I, you know, I've been making do, but I'm really excited to be able to finally get back out there and increase those sample sizes. But I'm in my sixth year. So like it's a late time to be going out into the field and getting this stuff. Our next question comes from Brandon. 
Yes. Uh, do we know why adult unflanged males are not found in zoos? Yeah, this is um, something that people have been thinking about for a long time. So for a long time, the assumption was that they're not going to stay in this unflanged state when they're in the presence of a flanged male. And because of the social structure of housing in zoos, it was thought that they aren't going into the unflanged state and they're quickly going into the flanged state because of how they're housed. But my paper with Kate showing how stress in childhood may affect which strategy they go on to doing and the ones who had really stressful childhoods flanged earlier and went on to become flanged males at a younger age, um, it could potentially indicate that perhaps zoos are stressful places for orangutans. We do have evidence of behaviors that occur in stressful environments being exhibited by orangutans in zoos. And if that is the case, that zoos are stressful, perhaps that's why they're going into that flange state and, and not staying. And, and I just found out that there perhaps is an adult unflanged male of a sanctuary, and, and maybe that is happening because it's not as stressful in a sanctuary as it is in a zoo. So I'm, I'm looking into this more, but I, I think the answer might have a lot to do with stress. What is your dream project? Because I know we we talked a little bit about this. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think it's it's I, I just don't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you do the talking. Yeah. I mean, Kate and I have talked about how amazing it would be to be able to mold some teeth of the orangutans in the wild. You know, sometimes maybe if they are doing some exams on them, medical exams, maybe we could get some dental molds, uh, and we could maybe look at the stress today, even if associated with some life history known data. So if we could answer this question about stress with even more detail if we could look at the ones that we know what their lives and their stress were like. So um, being able to study some of the orangutans in the wild today, maybe some, uh, my, my absolute dream would be to be able to study orangutan skeletons in the wild. Uh, there's a lot of logistical reasons why I'm concerned this might not eventually be possible, but it is a dream of mine to someday be able to do that kind of work. Um, so you know, that's, that's the dream. <laughs> we have another question from Brandon. Um, can you speak on biological sex and genetics? Do we see evidence of non-binary difference from a genetic perspective? Yeah, it depends on what aspect of genetics you're talking about. So in terms of chromosomes, uh, there are a number of people that exist who do not have either XX or XY chromosomes or people who have uh, perhaps the gender normative chromosomes, but present the other way because of which genes are turned on and off. So th this is really good evidence for a spectrum. Uh, medically, uh, individuals who exhibit these chromosomes are often um, described as having con conditions. But, uh, you know, we see these types of uh, differences in chromosomes across animals. This is a normal part of biological variation and how chromosomes appear. So it's, it's not necessarily that these are... Uh, conditions. This it can just be part of, in many cases, be just part of normal variation genetically. But then also you could be talking about other aspects of genetics as well that perhaps relate to hormones or body shape and size. And all of those aspects of how those are coded in the genetics are highly variable and uh, definitely are situated on a spectrum in, in ways perhaps arguably, arguably more so than in terms of chromosomes. Um do you have any advice for those who are watching or interested in studying biological anthropology? Yes. So I would definitely say um, to reach out for advice. When I was applying to PhD programs, I reached out to postdocs that were doing work that I was interested in and they wrote back some really helpful and kind um advice to me over email. I'm always uh, happy when I get emails from prospective and interested students, not that I can take students, but that I can give advice and, and be helpful, hopefully in that way and thinking out graduate school options and, and uh, what would be nice. So I'm always available via email and Twitter DM uh, to people who are interested in someday going into this kind of thing um, and thinking about that as well. But I mean, also just knowing that it's it's a it's a possible thing. You know, this is something that I didn't really know was accessible. I didn't know academia was like an accessible option for me when I was um, an undergraduate. So um, there are because of things like this, like lunch break science. Yeah. I'm I'm hoping that you know people can see that there are people that look like them um, out there doing science, and that it is an accessible thing for everybody, not just. Um, that traditional idea of a scientist. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful this didn't exist when I was in high school. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah, you know, um, it, it is. It's a, it, it's nice to have resources out there that, you know, are 
you know, showing kind of science in the process, because it's it really is such an interesting process. Yeah. Um, one question I had, too, is what is it like to gain access, the process of gaining access oh, yeah. to collections and museums? Um, and before I answer that, I thought of another piece of advice, which is just uh, to not give up. I actually, I'm going to admit it, I applied to the Leakey Foundation three times. I got this grant on my third try, and, and there's a lot of moments where I wanted to give up. So uh, the other piece of advice I just have is to, uh, I know it's so cliche, but <laughs> but when you see other people who keep trying and trying and eventually uh, are able to get it to not give up. Uh, the, the process of gaining access to museums is it's highly de uh, dependent on the museum. So like, for example, the Smithsonian, they've me for a very long time since I was just an undergraduate in 2013. Uh, so I, you know, it's it's very easy to write to the people I know there and know me for a very long time. But new museums, I mean, these people are getting a cold email from a stranger who's begging them to, to come and help print this work as to their dissertation. And, and so it helps once you have a contact with someone, they know you. But at the beginning, it's kind of hit or miss getting to know people. We have a, um, a, a question from Meredith. Um, she says, I enjoy your fun facts Twitter account, and I'm wondering if you can share one of your favorite fun facts about orangutans. And this, this will be our last question. Oh, thank you so much, Meredith. Um, oh, I have so many fun facts about orangutans. I think the one that always surprises people that's kind of fun is so that they're really smart. And slow lorises, they usually just eat fruit and leaves. But slow lorises are these like tiny, slow moving primate in the wild, and they actually have venomous teeth. They're the only primate that's a venomous and orangutans are smart. And so sometimes if they do feel like eating meat, they will knock a slow loris out of the tree and it'll fall to the ground and then they'll go down and get it. So then it doesn't bite them and with its venomous teeth. This, I read an account of this in a paper. I've not personally ever seen this, but I thought it was so weird. <laughs> and I thought it was a very fun fact. Yeah, that is, that is a really, so we'll have to, uh, I know we've shared your um, Twitter on, but we, we should reshare it. And okay. so you can learn is, more fun facts. Yes, it's Biwamp Fun Facts. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for joining us, Alexandra. Thank you for having me. Lunch Break Science will be back in 2022. We'll be meeting Leaky Foundation grantee Brenda Bradley and learn about how genetic and environmental variation shape the biological characteristics of primates. We hope you all have a... Uh, a wonderful rest of your 2021 year and that we'll see you in 2022 for an exciting lineup of human evolution scientists and research. Thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leaky Foundation and is made possible by the generous support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith. Visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, today's guest scientist, and how you can help support human evolution research and educational programs like Lunch Break Science. Right now, all donations will be matched by generous donors, meaning your impact will be doubled. Miss an episode of Lunch Break Science? Catch up on past episodes and browse our library of Leaky Foundation lectures on our YouTube channel. Still hungry for science and can't wait till our next episode? Check out the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, Origin Stories, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about exciting upcoming episodes and programs, as well as groundbreaking discoveries in human evolution research.